This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Good morning. And welcome to Triune Mercy Center. We are delighted that you're here, whether you're joining us in person or online. We welcome you this morning. Um, I want to draw your attention to our art piece for today. Uh, our own Russ Reed um, did this art piece here, and I want to thank him for allowing us to use it today in worship. Thank you, Russ. Yes. Um, I want you to look at your announcements in your bulletin. Um, just a reminder, please turn your cell phone off during the service. If you're interested in volunteering, please see Linda Hanna, or if you're fancy with technology, you can scan that QR code. One last call for the faith and finance class. If you are interested in some good knowledge of faith and finance, as well as home-cooked meals, please let Sherry know by tomorrow. She'll need to know by tomorrow. And right now, they only have two people signed up, so if there's not more people signing up, they'll have to postpone it until the spring. Um, beginning October 16th, we have some exciting news. We will have an intergenerational Bible study in the art room for children and parents and grandparents who want to come and learn of the Bible and have some art. So I want to thank Aaron and Andrew Predmore for volunteering to, to lead that study. So again, that starts on October the 16th at 10 a.m. and it will go until 10.45. So I hope that if um, you're a child and or you have um, family here, you would like to come, we would love to have you in the art room beginning on the 16th of October. Another note about worship today, today is World Communion. And what that means is all over the world, Christians, are celebrating at the Lord's table together. And so because it's World Communion, I went through some of my own um, pieces of beautiful material from all over the world, and it is on the communion table. And today we will hear music from all over the world, particularly the two hymns we will be singing are South African hymns. And they're actually chants. So if you don't know them, I just we trust the Spirit, amen? And we will worship the living God. So now let us turn our hearts and minds and souls. Before we do that, though, we have to greet. So on the front of our bulletin, you see the phrase, you are God's child, and you are welcome in this place. So please greet one another in the peace of Christ, saying these words. You're God's child.
keep standing up. We're gonna we're gonna worship God. Here we go. You can sing better when you're standing up. Now we do have to have a little lesson here. Now, girls, don't pay any attention. This is just for the guys. This is the big manly part of this song. So if y'all give me a so this is what you're gonna do. One, two, three, four. Home, 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 home. Come all ye people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come all you people, come and praise your maker. Come now and worship the Lord. Come on the Savior. call the worship. You may be seated.
worship, we're always aware of how we can fall short and how we can turn away from God's plan for fruitfulness and flourishing. And so our hope returns to us when we can offer our confession. And so let us now offer our confession before one another and before God, as it's printed in your bulletin. It is never easy for us to confess, but deep down inside, we know that graced, we have trouble being graceful. Forgiven, we are eager to judge and punish all who hurt us. Freed, we find ways to put restrictions on ourselves and others we fear. Forgive us, servant God. You show mercy more often than we deserve. You pardon us more times than we can count. And why? Because we are yours, sisters and brothers of your son, Jesus Christ, who died and lived again, so we might live beyond death with you. Amen. God's hand of mercy is stretched out to us, making a way through all that threatens us to touch us with grace and hope. We stand before our God, singing praise to the one who turns our despair into joy, our fears into faith. Amen. Well, last week, we talked about Joseph, you know, the one with the coat of many colors, who ends up in a pit because his brothers put him there, and then he's sold into slavery in Egypt, and last we let, left him, he was thrown into jail, being accused of something he did not do by Potiphar's wife, and so today, we're going to skip a whole lot, and I'm going to try to fill in the gaps before we get to today's story in the Bible. The Joseph narrative links the ancestral promises given by God to Abram in the Genesis story where Amanda preached a few weeks ago, and that leads us to the Exodus story of oppression and liberation that we will read this morning. Well, among God's promises to Abram, were a few things. One is that God would make of him a great nation, bless that nation, and then provide land inheritance for those people. Keep that in mind as we read today's story. Well, Joseph, when he got out of jail, eventually he became the second in command in all of Egypt, with Pharaoh being the first in command. Needless to say, his brothers came 
and they reconciled eventually. And all the Israelites moved into Egypt. Well, things were all hunky-dory for a while. But we get a clue at the beginning of the book of Exodus, chapter 1, where we are told that soon another Pharaoh comes into power who did not know Joseph. In other words, the Israelites were done for. And this Pharaoh was threatened by the Israelites. They were bigger and they outnumbered the Egyptians. They were stronger. And soon those Israelites became slaves to Pharaoh and to the Egyptians. But they still kept growing in number and it really ticked Pharaoh off. And so soon he pronounced that any sons born to any Hebrew women would be thrown into the Nile. Well, one Hebrew woman hid. She hid her baby son for three months until she could no longer hide him. And then she put him in a reed basket and covered the bottom with black tar and sent him on his way down the Nile where he bumped into Pharaoh's daughter who was bathing in that same water. Well, soon, Pharaoh's daughter adopted this child whose name was Moses. And Moses' sister, Miriam, was hiding in the bushes to watch as her baby brother went down the Nile. And there's more to that story, but Moses grew up in Pharaoh's house as his grandson. So Moses had one foot in with the Hebrew people, the Israelites, and he had one foot in with the Egyptians. Well, that Pharaoh eventually died, and another one rose to power. And the Israelites remained enslaved in Egypt, and now it was getting upwards of over 400 years of the Israelites being enslaved. Keep that in mind. The Israelites... They groaned because of their hard work. They cried out, and God heard their cry of grief, remembering his covenant with Abram, Abraham, who we call later, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. Well, Moses, meanwhile, had grown up and married before God called him, much like Abram, except for the burning bush thing, and told him, that God had heard the cry of injustice of God's people. And the I am who I am sent Moses, not before he tried to make every excuse in the book to not go, to negotiate with someone who does not negotiate. Make no mistake about it. This was a battle between the God of Israel and Pharaoh and the Egyptian gods. I do have to say, though, I wonder why it took God so long to act. Moses met with Pharaoh and told him about the God of the Israelites, the great I Am, but Pharaoh stepped it up a notch. He was a little cocky, making the slaves' lives a little more miserable. And Moses discouraged, asked God why this was happening, and God assured him that the Israelites would soon be free. And Moses went back again to Pharaoh. But Pharaoh did not budge. Thus began the ten plagues. You all might remember them. The last of which culminated in the first Passover. You know, when the angel of death passed over the houses that didn't have lamb's blood smeared on the doorpost or over the board of the doors killing every firstborn son in the Egyptian households. It's just like what Pharaoh had done earlier. That night, Pharaoh called for Moses and his brother Aaron, and he said, get up and get out. Get away from my people, both you and the Israelites. Go worship your Lord. You can even take your flocks and your herds. Just go. Meanwhile, the Israelites didn't think twice about it and fled Egypt with Moses as God leads them the roundabout way through the Reed Sea or the Red Sea Desert. 
One interesting thing that the text tells us before we get there is that Moses took with him Joseph's bones, just as Joseph had made Israel's sons promise when he said to them, when God takes care of you, you must carry my bones out here with you. You see, God had a plan and wanted the Egyptians to know that he is Lord. And this is where we pick up in today's story. Thank you for listening so well. This story today is one of the most well-known stories in all of the Bible. But before we read, let us pray together. Let us pray. Spirit, fall on us like the rain. Spirit, fall on us like the wind. Holy Spirit, shine on us like the sun, like the sun. Sanctify and heal us and make us one. Amen. I have some friends who are going to help us out in this morning's scripture reading. As they come on up, we will be reading from the book of Exodus, chapter 14, and various verses that are listed in your bulletin. And I invite you to listen for a word from God. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, the minds of Pharaoh and his officials were changed toward the people, and they said, What have we done, letting Israel leave our service? So he had his chariot made ready and took his army with him. He took 600 picked chariots, and all the other chariots of Egypt with officers over all of them. As Pharaoh drew near, the Israelites looked back, and there were Egyptians advancing on them. In great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, Uh, Excuse me. Was it because there was no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? And this is this not the way, very way thing we t- would? I'm, I'm sorry, I'm getting confused. The thing told you in Egypt: let us alone and let us serve the Egyptians, for it would be, have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. But Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you have only to keep still. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land and the waters were divided. The Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, the waters forming a wall for them on their right and on their left. The Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. At the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. The Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea. The waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers, the entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea. 
not one of them remained. But the Israelites walked on dry ground through the sea, the waters forming a wall on their right and on their left. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, God. to God. And thank you, readers, for helping this morning. I have to confess that upon reading this story, I am at first very uncomfortable with all the violence that happens before and during today's story. I have to say that I wish there could have been another way. I have so many questions that remain unanswered until I meet God face to face. Does anybody else have that list? You can join me. I'm not going to try and justify this violence as this passage to the Red Sea portrays slavery's end in Egypt in vivid, violent detail. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did not believe that violence was the way to resist injustice. He believed that at the center of nonviolence stood the principle of love. King also said, quote, Freedom is never given voluntarily from the oppressor. It must be demanded by the oppressed, end quote. And Pharaoh, he wasn't giving in to God's demands. The freedom of God's people did not occur in a vacuum. There were consequences, human costs. There was truth-telling, and there was a disturbingly costly justice. You see, God, who is faithful to God's promises, has a preference for the poor and for freeing those who are oppressed. And God's demonstration of saving power leads to Pharaoh finally relenting. So we thought. Until Pharaoh talks himself out of his initial decision to let the enslaved people go free. But dictators like Pharaoh desperately hold on to power even though they are destroying their own people. And at the end of the day, for Pharaoh, the economic benefits of having slaves far outweighs the deaths of the Egyptians, even his own son. You see, oftentimes, economics are put above the well-being of people. Amen? And this is who God is fighting against. And this still goes on today, as slavery is not over. The intrusive grace of the liberating God to break these structures of oppression isn't over. It is ongoing all over the world. Think child labor, human trafficking, the women protesting now in Iran, just to name a few. Just as in today's biblical story, the Lord acts and speaks and saves. Now, we could go over every detail in this story and be here all day, but I won't do that to you. But I don't want us to miss that beginnings require endings. I'm going to say that again. Beginnings require endings. You see, the exodus, the road out of slavery to freedom, is a new creation or birth. God's power to create from nothing, from formlessness, we are told in Genesis, and void. That's the same power here that God uses to save and transform. And the Israelites thought they were a free people, but they were trapped between the big Egyptian army advancing toward them with their fancy chariots and the impassable Red Sea. They could not escape the situation that they were in on their own. You see, they had hoped years ago, and their hope was now wavering, if 
even there at all. Yet they had enough courage and trust to get this far on their journey to freedom. But they are terrified, we are told, and their grumbling begins. They could have at least still had food to eat had they stayed in Egypt as slaves. They knew where their next meal was coming from, amen? Now, this is poignant and real, so listen up. We all know of those times in our own lives where we choose to stay in a bad situation or with a bad habit for fear that it will be worse to go and face the unknown than to be back in the way life that we know it, oppressed or not. Often, friends, it is fear that holds us back from embracing new life and opportunities for our future, the future that God has in mind for each of us. You see, a little hope or belief that something is actually going to change in our lives is required in order to leave something behind. Again, to have an ending, you need to welcome a new beginning. You say goodbye so that you can say hello. Amen? And once you allow yourself to believe something is possible with God, you risk losing that hope. And so you tell yourself, I can't do it. Because if you leave for the unknown, you don't know what's going to happen. And it's a spiraling cycle. Think addiction. Any kind of addiction. Think life. But God. Can I get an amen? amen? But God has plans nobody could have predicted. God cleared a dry path through the sea. God makes a way out of no way, fighting for justice to defeat oppression. You see, death, salvation, liberation, creation, they're all intricately woven together. In this story, death becomes the conduit of salvation and recreation of the Jewish people, the Israelites. And we as Christians, we look at the cross. In today's story and in our own stories, where we don't see a way forward, God makes a way. Can I get an amen? amen. A way through the sea, the impassable sea, where we all can emerge from death into new life. But God. Friends, I highly commend a book by a woman, a young woman, a young African-American woman named Cole Arthur Riley. And the book is entitled This Here Flesh. And in it, she wisely claims that when someone has endured bondage for so long, hear me now, and has still found some manner of survival, they may assess the risk of liberation to be greater than the violence of their chains. When one has gone without food for so long, their stomachs become used to smaller portions. If one has gone without a roof over their head, once you have a roof, you are less inclined to tell the landlord when it's leaking. In the book Beloved by Toni Morrison, she famously writes, quote, Freeing yourself was one thing. Claiming ownership of that freed self was another. End quote. Friends, in pursuit of liberation, of freedom, we do not need to pine after the power of our oppressor. We have to long for our own power through God to be fully realized. For one's dignity can never be chained. Amen? Amen? Let's talk about addiction, for example. Or actually, I want to ask each of you, what obstacles or things stand in your way of experiencing the full life that God wants for each of us? You know, the abundant life that Jesus promises each of us, but God. 
but God can make a way where there does not appear to be a way. And friends, my, my, there is a cost to freedom. For true freedom is letting go of not only the past and having an ending, but of the fear and having the courage to face the unknown, trusting that God is the one in charge and trusting in the possibility of a better future despite all the evidence. But again, often we are terrified or too paralyzed to act, yet over and over again, God calls us to courage and patience. And it's not an easy thing to come by when anxiety stirs us to flight, flee, or freeze. Friends, you cannot talk someone into liberation. Telling someone to just get free is like telling someone to stop grinding their teeth or biting their nails. Freedom requires patience with ourselves, being gentle, as it takes time to feel at peace if all you've ever known is insecurity. It's the process of your soul learning to trust again. Trust that your soul can rest and love and be still without being destroyed. Now, during the Civil Rights Act and movement, Dr. King motivated his listeners to fight against racial injustice and to seek the freedom that their nation had promised them. King compared their struggle for racial equality to this biblical story in Exodus. He compares the Israelites' captivity with the plight of African Americans in the mid-20th century and the U.S. Supreme Court's landmark decision in Brown versus the Board of Education. King wanted to reassure his listeners that when God lifted the sea and those nine Supreme Court justices led the way to desegregate schools, that they would find justice and equality if they persevered through their hardships just as the Israelites did. Dr. King says, quote, let us not despair, let us not lose faith, in humans, and certainly not in God. We must believe that a prejudiced mind can be changed and that humans, by the grace of God, can be lifted from the valley of hate to the high mountain of love, end quote. Well, today, our Jewish friends no longer have their temple. They no longer eat Passover sacrifices. However, they still eat the matzah, the unleavened bread, and the bitter herbs at the Passover Seder meal. Though the traditions and meanings behind it vary, they celebrate during that meal by drinking four cups of wine, symbolizing joy and freedom, one cup for each word of redemption or deliverance in Exodus. And they thank God for God's redeeming work through the ten plagues. Then they take their finger into the cup and they spill the wine onto their plate, thus diminishing the joy since their freedom came at the expense of others even if they were deserving of the punishment. Friends, we as followers of Christ cannot ignore the bodies on the seashore because to ignore them is to ignore the reality of death and the limits of greed, exploitation, and empire in which we live. And as we look at those bodies, let us see clearly enough that our fear gives way to faith. For the promised land, my friends, is on the horizon. May we trust the next chapter because we know the creator, redeemer, and sustainer. May we also heed Moses' words to the Israelites 
Do not be afraid. Stand firm and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you, and you only have to keep still. Thanks be to our saving God, but God. Amen. Is a redeemer, a way maker. He provides for us in all that we have and all that we are are gifts from God. And so we have an opportunity to give back to God what is already His through His tithes and our offerings. of my heart cause you found me you freed me held back the waters for my release oh Yahweh you're the God who fights for me Lord of every victory hallelujah hallelujah you have taught A sign that you are with me. The fire by night, the guiding light to my feet. Cause you found me, you freed me, held back the waters for my release. Oh, Yahweh, you're the God who fights for me, Lord of heaven.
You have torn apart the sea. You have led me through the deep. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh. Gracious and loving God, you move and we participate in your movement. And all that we are and all that we have are your gifts. And so we rejoice to give back some of your good gifts back to you. And we ask that you will bless these tithes and these offerings so that they may be a blessing for others. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. as we come to Christ's table. We will have three stations. You will be escorted by an usher to come on down. We have gluten-free wafers here at the altar. Jesus shared a Passover meal, a Seder meal, with his disciples in what Christians call the Last Supper. Jesus took the elements of the Seder Passover meal and he made them symbols of his death. This became the basis for the First Communion, the Lord's Supper. Here at Triune, we practice an open table, which means that all who, are, who long to encounter Jesus are welcome to this holy meal at this grace-filled table. Friends, Christ invites all of us to this holy banquet on this World Communion Sunday all around the world. Christians celebrate this holy meal with Jesus Christ as our host. So, come to the table with thanks. Come to the table with thanks. Thankful for all of God's bounty on earth. Come to the table with thanks. Come to the table of grace. Come to the table of grace. This is God's table. It's not yours or mine. Come to the table of grace. Let us pray. O oh God, who holds the whole world in your hands, for dividing the waters at creation, creating order out of chaos, and a place and space for your creatures, we praise and thank you. For the renewal of life on earth, following the flood, for the salvation of the Israelites through the Red Sea, for our renewal and redemption by baptism. We, we praise, praise and, and thank you. you. For allowing us to be part of the work of recovery from devastating floods and from disease and drought, wars and divisions, embodying your love and presence. We, we praise, praise and, and thank, thank you. you. For working and with and through your people, from Noah to Abraham and Sarah, from Joseph to Miriam and Moses, for working with and through us, we, we praise, praise and, and thank, thank you. you. For always pursuing your people and blessing us, that we may be a blessing. 
We praise and thank you for the many ways you call, convict, and care for us. We praise and thank you for sending Jesus to live as one of us, to share in our sorrows and joys, to lead us from death and destruction to resurrection and rejoicing. We, we praise and, and thank, thank you for our participation in Jesus' very lifeblood, in the spirit that hallowed and ordered the waters of chaos and creation, with you who cradles the whole world in your hands. We, we praise and, and thank you. you. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us these gifts of bread and cup that we may share of the very lifeblood with the world, hallowing the ordering of the waters of chaos, cradling and bathing the whole world in your love. Teach us to pray as Christ taught us the disciples to pray. Our, Our Father, Father, who, who art, art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. On the night of his arrest, Jesus was with his disciples and before breaking the bread, he took it, he blessed it, and then he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, given, given for, you. for you. Every time you eat of it, do this in remembrance of me. The same manner, he took the cup and he poured it out, saying, this cup, it is sealed in my blood, shed for the forgiveness of sins. Every time you drink of it, remember me. For as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. And come again he will. The gifts of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God.
Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Sometimes I feel like a motherless child. Alone.
God, you formed us in your image. You formed the universe and your wisdom and created all things by your power. You call us to live and die with you in faith. Help us to go now in the joy of knowing that we all have been included, included at your table, included in our common life with you. Send us from your table, Lord, fed to tell others that they too are included to the inner life of God who is love. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, we pray. Amen. Amen. Friends, freedom is coming. Freedom is here. And God has parted the waters of the impassable Red Sea. Now it's up to us. Are we really going to live in the freedom that God has already given us? Are we going to name it and claim it? Friends, there are beginnings and there have to be endings. So today is a new beginning. Thanks be to God. And now, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, may the love of God and the friendship and fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each and every one of you, now and forevermore, world without end. Freedom is coming. Amen. Come let us worship the Lord. 